Fröhliches neues Jahr. Say again. Happy New Year. Oh, happy. What, what language is that? It was an attempted German. Oh. <laughs> Wait till Heiner's on and can say it again. Fröhliches neues Jahr. Or something like that. I always get the uh, male female designation of the pronoun wrong. What do you call that? Degenerative? I don't know. It's been degenerate, a long time. Yeah, degenerate. <laughs> degenerate form. Degenerate form. Hey, Stace. Good morning. Happy New Year. How do you say that in Hebrew? How do you say that in Yiddish? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good yard. Gesinta uh, <laughs> something, right? Or a mazel tov. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to lower my speakers. Whoops, made you disappear. Do you still have the uh, lipstick filter on? <laughs> oh, I don't know how to get it off. I have no idea. You should ask Kayla for a guidance on that. She knows I how to. Think Kayla's going to know how to answer that question. I, I spoke to somebody who's been in Silicon Valley for 30 years and they didn't, they, it sounded more complicated. I think you just need to uninstall that snap cam. Whatever I did. That thing is. I did. It's uninstalled. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's not snap cam then. It's something else. Or it made changes that are now persistent. I, don't, I mean, look, I just woke up anyway, so who cares at this, <laughs> at this point? I uh, am three years early, uh, three hours earlier than you, and I just woke up. My dog is still sleeping. He's tired. To, I have to leave at some point because I didn't get to walk him. Good morning, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Yeah, but the know? question is, did the dog survive the fireworks? I don't, I don't, I didn't hear any. Well, yeah, we did. It wasn't that loud. And he's not afraid of fireworks because, um, you know, he was always around them. And when he first heard them, you know, I treated him the way I treated a child. And I would be like, oh, you know, I would make those like happy sounds. So he never really got, you know, scared by them. He's a very special dog. <laughs> so your dog uh, doesn't mind fireworks? As long as yeah. he's with me and as long as he's around people and he sees that everybody's calm, he's fine. Our cat does not like fireworks. She just uh, flies into the bedroom. Uh. Where is she far enough? Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it wasn't, you know, I was thinking I hadn't even paid attention to them. I do remember getting into the car and hearing them, but it wasn't even that loud. I'm actually far enough away from the crowds that uh, they're just very distant boom boom but nothing too uh, disruptive so my pets are actually okay with it but across the water I can actually see dozens of places actually doing fireworks so it's uh, pretty impressive just looking three to six miles across the water and seeing the entire coast you know busy with fireworks yeah. Really cool thing to see it synchronized like that. Like so many people are doing it at the same time. Actually, it's yesterday, sure. last night was the very first time that I was invited to a place that had a little get together and they had bought, I don't know, probably like $400 worth of uh, fireworks and we're setting it off in the backyard. And so all these little trains of fireworks usually go boom, 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 boom. And we see all these different patterns. We saw that directly from underneath it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. All righty. Well, I didn't think I was gonna to bring too much today. I have lots of notes still, but it's January 1st. So we can do whatever people wanna do for the new year. And if there's silence, then I can break that silence. <laughs> Knowing you guys, I don't think it's going to be silent. <laughs> Us in particular, this this crowd in particular. Uh, well, you guys who are the regulars, you know, there's always something going on. I have a question that I would like to start with, and it can serve as a check-in or anything, and then you can go on to what you want. Okay. 
Absolutely. My question is, how important, uh, how, uh, look, it's important to everybody that they trust the person they're with, but how important is it to you that somebody else trusts you? Also, it depends on the situation or the kind of relationship, maybe. Are you thinking about a certain kind of situation? Or? Um, I'm actually added in the negative. I'm actually thinking, how much does it bother? Like, I'm sure everybody feels differently, but does it bother you when somebody doesn't believe you or trust you when you're being truthful? So I don't mean trust in terms of skill, but in terms of telling the truth, if you're being truthful and somebody doesn't believe you, how much does that bother you, if it bothers you at all? I can say that it bothers me quite a lot if it's a close relationship. And if it's not, then significantly less. Yeah, yeah, to me. yeah go ahead, Barry. Uh, I would say it, it, it probably presages a disconnect in the relationship, if it's serious enough. I mean, you can, you can look at being defriended on Facebook, which is not an uncommon experience. And if you sort of <clears throat> analyze the cases, um, yeah, I think trust was an issue that <clears throat> figured into defriending uh, examples. Yeah, I think I'm pretty consistent. It depends on what you want to co-create with this person. If there's, you know, no huge stakes, then you can say, okay, that person's not going to take my word, despite the history, despite the uh, known track record, then I can gradually shift to spending time with others, you know? Right. But yeah. if I've already committed to co-creating something, then I think it would be a bigger deal. Yeah, I think if you committed to a project and got some investment in the project, yeah, then you might have artistic differences, quote unquote, or design differences, and you may want to try to thrash those out. But you know, from I mean, look look at the history of rock groups, music groups, when they have breakups over artistic differences, or they want to move the content in a different direction. I see. I must have interrupted Sam. No, I, I'm thinking that seems to be different than the question that Stacy asked. I think. Artistic and design differences are fine. That doesn't seem to be a distrust. A distrust, according to Stacy's question, was a question of honesty slash integrity. That's what I was thinking. Oh, well, yeah, I, I guess that doesn't apply to artistic differences, but it does lead to breakups. So. <laughs> oh, definitely. But uh, yeah, I mean, just the wrong rats could lead to breakups, but <laughs> I thought Stacy was asking something much more specific. Yeah, I guess I was tying it too closely to the disconnect breakup uh, consequence. But I think that, you know, half of it, I think the disconnect definitely has something to do with it, you know, because then, you know, the next question is, well, why would it bother somebody? You know, if somebody's telling the truth, why would it bother them if somebody else didn't believe them? And I think that you hit on it. It has to do with not feeling connected. You waste your time. It's you know. Remember that that classical uh, couple, the Bickersons. You know, they spent all their time bickering, and like, what's the point of that? What kind of relationship is that? It's stressful and it's disconnecting and unpleasant. You bicker with somebody and still trust them. Yeah, yes. I, I mean, in in research, you can bicker over some technical uh, detail that you really haven't nailed down yet. Yeah. But hopefully you eventually do the research and work it out. I mean, if it's a solid relationship, you can you can bicker over the mathematical model or, or the calculations or predictions or something like that. But if you're doing science, you should be able to eventually resolve it. Right. And then one more point, which I sometimes like to bring in these things is there's at least three levels of relationship, right? So if it's the first occurrence of something, then you can actually address the merits of that thing and those points and be reasonable about it. 
if both parties can be so. If there's a pattern, then addressing the pattern is more important. But you know, after a while, the pattern affects negatively the relationship. And at that point, it's really serious. It becomes so there's at least three levels there that you know you can sort of differentiate among. Both. Once the pattern becomes tiresome and doesn't evolve, then what's the point? You're just spinning your wheels, just wasting time and energy and getting no place. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So Stacy, was it an adequate uh, treatment of your question? Yeah, it's just, you know, it occurred to me that there are some people that really don't care. I didn't think it would be anybody here, but there are some people that don't care if you trust them or not, as long as they get their way. And I'm just not, I, I don't know that I really have a handle on that kind of thinking. So would that be someone who's got enough power and influence that they don't care what you think? I guess so. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think what you're outlining, Stacy, is what psychologists call the dark triad or the dark tetrad. Are you familiar with that term? It's like there's um, three or four traits that sort of can be arbitrarily mixed, but they sort of define that narcissism, sociopathy, Machiavellianism, and even sadism is the fourth one. And so Trump was the poster child for all four of those. So he had the dark triad. He was the poster child for the dark tetrad. But, you know, any any mix of that and eventually you're going to throw up your hands and say, I'm out of here. This is this is just ridiculous. But they can still have power. You can have a you can have the host of a, um, a, a moderator of a session where they've got the power. And if they're using their power and manifesting narcissism, sociopathy, Machiavellianism, and even sadism, you know, you're probably not going to stay around unless you're a masochist. You're not going to stick around. And, you know, I've been kicked out of a lot of chat rooms over my time, including I even got written up in Time magazine for famously being kicked out of chat rooms back in the 90s. So, and it was people who were like that. Yeah. Well, I also was, I also was thinking in terms, not so much, the other thing I was thinking about in terms where accuracy plays a role. So from, as somebody that wants to be trusted, it's very important for me to try and be accurate because I want what I say to be, you know, I want it to be consistent and I want it, you know, to consistent with facts and consistent with, you know, what I normally say. And I was thinking that people that don't care if somebody else trusts them, they're less likely to try and be accurate. They're just going to try and be as persuasive as they can using whatever information is available. So I think that's where it started from. I forgot because I thought about the question a while ago. So I forgot why. That disconnect is the disconnect between politics and science. You know, I can usually stick around with somebody on science and I don't dabble in politics, but if I get opposite somebody who's more into politics and not into science, I'm into science, not politics, it's, it's going to be butting heads and it's, it's not going to survive. So I'll characterize that uh, slightly differently. Rather than politics versus science, I would say perhaps power versus truth, might yeah. versus right. Yep. Yep. Is I had rather, a boss. Uh, hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Uh. I was just going to say, yeah, I briefly had a boss. He was a newly promoted department head, and he was building his department. And he recruited me without neither of us knowing each other. And we didn't get along. And he was kind of narcissistic and sociopathic. But the thing, the one thing he said, which clinched it, is he said, and I was doing the, I was doing the technical analysis for this project. And, he's, and, and he was sort of had to make the final decisions about what we would do with the project. And he said to me, Barry, he said, by the way, his name was also Barry. He said, when you and I disagree, then I have to prevail. And that said, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? Are you renting my brain or are you renting my obedience? Can I give you another story along those lines? Sure. 
I think I've mentioned it before. I used to work for a startup, which unfortunately I started with a friend of mine. He was CEO, I was co-founder and his father became terminally ill. So he decided to step down. And so the VCs decided to bring in a different CEO. This different CEO eventually, after I asked him, why are we doing this versus that? And, you know, try to sort of co-discuss various different options. He said, he pulled out his business card and said, because it says here, I am the CEO. Oh, there you go. His, that's his response. Right. You know? Yeah. So, same story. Yeah. Different words, same story. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so was there then not a sufficient trust between the two of you so that you could discuss it as equals, so to say, or, or just discuss what's a, a good option? I suspect there's a number of reasons why people don't want to get into reasonable discussions. One of them being they can't. You know, the other being they enjoy power. Yeah. Or they could, you know, think that it won't lead anywhere. That could be a case where there's a distrust. Like, if I distrust somebody then I don't want to go into a long discussion with them, perhaps because I feel that nothing fruitful will come out of it. But isn't that a prejudice? Like literally a pre-judgment? Sure, yeah. Yep, I agree. But, but I guess that's kind of what it is. You always sort of <clears throat> judge whether you can trust somebody. Or... Uh, pr President Janie Orlean was a caricature a send-up of that. In fact, I was going to bring up that movie myself. Not too surprising. <laughs> Have you guys both watched the movie? Stacy? Yeah. Glenn? What's yeah, I just, want to, I just want to end this first thing, and I just want to say, it just struck me that most people agree that trust needs to be earned, and I think that if you're in a position of power, sometimes you don't feel like doing the work to earn that. Right. Not everybody, surprisingly, feels that trust needs to be earned. I hear a lot of people saying, I just automatically give trust, and then somebody has to convince me that they're not trustworthy. Right. So I think that's almost, you know, in effect, setting everyone up for disappointment, in a sense. You know? but, but I wonder, isn't it, if you're going to get into a position of power, then surely you have to be trusted by at least somebody. Otherwise, you wouldn't get that position yeah i think it's very it doesn't sound it sounds to me that people who who don't care about anybody trusting them will be very likely to gain any power well you could be trusted in a negative way you could be you could trust that that person will really screw you if you don't do what they say yeah I guess that is a kind of trust as well. But I, I doubt if it's enough, though, to, to earn really powerful influence in the long run. A, a tragic example that was reprised, you know, this last week of the year, they, they play back all the best episodes during the year on public radio. And they played back the episode where... Um, Technic Chakrabarty interviewed Larry Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff for Colin Powell. And of course, the big story was how he was coerced into giving that speech at the UN, claiming, you know, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And, and he had pretty good evidence that that was not the case. And um, <clears throat> two guys at the CIA who were higher ranked than him fed him bogus information and coerced him into including that story and it was he said it's a blot on his record you know he didn't have enough power to be trusted you know to do his own research and and it's it's really a sad story but it's an example of how it can really wreck a br otherwise brilliant career but see in an industry and in an institution that thrives on secrecy that can help happen to anyone exactly regardless how spotless your record was prior Right. If you're fed bad information by somebody who ought to know better and is manipulating 
the amount of information that's being presented and requiring you to use the information that's provided and you can't independently uh, disconfirm it, you can really go down the rabbit hole and get into serious trouble and end up taking the fall for it too. And that's by design, the way these organizations are set up. Exactly. Yeah. This, uh, I don't know how far we want to go with this topic, but it ties in a little bit to a topic we spoke about some time earlier about reliable sources of information. And um, I, th I think, Barry, you wrote a post about this. Yeah, it was this hypothesis that if you want to propagate a lie, you have to spend much more energy to propagate a lie than to propagate something that's true. And um, so that was an interesting point because if you want to propagate a lie, you often have to create other lies to support it and you have to cover your tracks and you have to do all kinds of work to, to avoid it being exposed. But if you, if you have you know, a true story, then you don't have to do all that work. Uh, so it's less energy uh, intensive. So, so that, that was, and I guess less risk. So I wrote a little comment on that thread, but I don't think it was followed up, but I thought this was an interesting thought experiment. And that is, imagine if it's developed a lie detector test, which is one, very reliable. Uh, two, it's, it's fairly accessible to most people. And three, it is believed to be accessible and reliable by most people. So, so, if, so the hypothesis is if you had that kind of a lie detector test and it was fairly easy to use and most people knew about it, and then I wonder you know, what would be the long-term consequences of that? It possibly, you know, th there would be a lot of cases where you have word against word, where telling a lie would be very risky. So you, you would be better off just telling the truth straight away, because you, it would all, there could be a situation word against word, and where one person can say, okay, I'll take the lie detector test. Uh, are you willing to do that? And if it's then generally known that the test is reliable, then it's, it's difficult to imagine what a good response to that would be. I think for many of the Me Too cases, I think it would be an interesting thing. Like, uh, for example, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of cases. But, but I mean, there's, there will always be gray zones, right? But, but for all those cases where there's a specific word against word and it's, it's a known fact and one person knows that they're telling the truth and the other person knows that they're lying. If, if you had a really reliable lie detector test, that might change the whole equation. So I, I wanted to just, I've just been thinking about mentioning that for you guys because it ties in with some stuff. We if, if you ask somebody, do you honestly- uh, Barry? Yeah, oh, Stacey's sorry. Been really up quite a while. I'm not sure Glenn is done, and I've also. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I would just love to. Go ahead, Stacey. I didn't mean guys. to uh, jump in. When... Okay, so I'll just address Glenn's point first because I had said something similar. You know, I've been thinking about as human beings evolve, they say we're going to evolve into multi-sensory creatures instead of just relying on the three senses. And I was thinking, how different would things be when you knew that whatever you were getting was deceptive. That being said, to go back to um, how hard it is to lie, the thing is what good liar, like in it, what good liars do is they take existing facts and they just add on to them in a way that makes it very difficult. So in a small system where a lot of people are talking, there's a good chance they'll get found out. 
because it's a smaller system. And you can real, as soon as you can find one thing, and I think it happens by chance, you know, but that's why I tend to talk a lot and include a lot of specifics in what I say in the hopes that somebody else, that, that will all, it's sort of like when Sam talks about transparency. With all the information there, it's easy to see when something was manipulated to look like something else. However, in a big system like we see in the media, there are truths there. So they're not manufacturing the truths. They're just presenting it in a way that looks differently. And there are not enough people that check to see that it is the way it appears to be. So like what I'm saying is like a sociopath, and I've had experience with this, they will anticipate what somebody's next behavior will be. Then to another group, they will predict that behavior. So when that behavior occurs, the person that was given this information will assume that that was the cause and effect behind everything. I don't know if that makes sense. Sam, you, so. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I think it's a little bit beside specific lies, though. It's it's more in the domains of propaganda or something like that. What you mentioned there. For example, I'll, I'll give an example. Barry gets up and walks into the other room. You don't know Barry. Barry's not around. And I tell you, he's got a really bad drug problem. He's going into the bathroom to shoot up. You're never going to confront him on that. You're just going to assume, wow, that's the and that that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. That's why I think it's so important to confirm with people when you have a question about something. Sam, I'm done. Okay, I just have two things to respond to. Uh, maybe I'll respond to your last point after that. Okay, and that is. Uh, this thing about whether or not truth or lies are easier to propagate, I think there's two perspectives here. One is if you've told the truth or if you've told a lie and you want to retract it in some way, okay? Uh, the lie, it appears, has legs. We all know this, right? And so it appears that it gains momentum if it's a particularly well-told lie that people want to believe. And those are hard to retract. You know, there's the whole saying, right? The truth is barely put on her shoes and lies already halfway around the world. Yeah. On the other hand, from a personal perspective, by maintaining a lie or a truth, then I actually agree with you. It's easier personally to tell a lie because there's nothing to remember, right? On the other hand, if you tell a Sorry, did I say yeah, that? No, the yeah. If you've told the truth, there's it's nothing different. to remember. But if you've told a lie, now you got to say, okay, who did I tell that to? Or what does that imply? So I better not, you know, counter that implication. Otherwise, people will think that I, you know, didn't mean the uh, the lie itself. Anyway, so there's a lot of complexity internally in maintaining lies. So I think that might be the sense in which you were uh, discussing it. But as far as, you know, whether it propagates, the lies uh, propagate very easily. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the Republican Party the way it is, okay? So that's point number one. Point number two is this lie detector that you want. That's exactly what I've been trying to say we need, right? That's what Doug Engelbart was saying we need to build for ourselves in this DKR, which can actually have the compendium of all knowledge linked, supported, contradicted, associated, you know, cited, you know, with this big interconnect where single statements can't just live on their own. Because if they do, today, it's easy for those single statements to be projected with such volume and such authority and such celebrity that people don't have the means to say, you know, do I question this or not? No, I trust blah, 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 you know, fill in blah, blah, blah with whatever you use uh, in your belief system, whether it's money, whether it's power, whether it's politics, whether it's celebrity, whether it's good looking, whether it's somebody who's tall, et cetera, et cetera, right? But if you've got this DKR where we've got lots of models and lots of different you know, reasoning paths and this thing sticks on its own, then you can actually build the associations. What supports it? 
what contradicts it? And now you look at the whole corpus of knowledge. There's clearly always going to be something that contradicts it because there are people who are interested in that position. There's also going to be people who actually support it. Again, the same reason. But if you look underneath that, what do they cite? What do they actually have for evidence? How do they do the reasoning? That's how you get to lie detectors. And this is also truth veracity, truth verification. This is why we need a DKR. And until we have an appreciation for truth, we're not gonna co-create this. And right now, the appreciation for truth is being eroded very effectively by money, by power, by politics, by stupidity, by bad education, by the factory mindset. And that's why I think restoring an appreciation for truth is essential for this particular species. Oh. And until I, we do that, we're still on a downward slope. I think that I think there's quite a lot of appreciation for truth, but it's not uh, nearly enough. Not nearly enough. Maybe not enough, but that I think there's some a lot of appreciation for truth for most people. But the problem is there's there's a couple of problems. One is it's it's very difficult to speak the truth in many cases, and uh, another problem is often you just don't know the truth. So you know, for example, with many of the political discussions, uh, we're speaking about things that hardly anybody knows about. It. Like, if, if if let's say we have a, a conversation about the personality of, of Donald Trump, whether he's a this or that triad, for example, like I'm pretty sure there's not a single person in this room who's ever spoken to him personally, or to you know any of the others. As, so that's just one example, but but you know, in the, example of what? it's an example of a of situation where there's a large conversation between many people about a topic that none of them know anything about. Not true. Where, where, well, where all of them have access to information that come from very unreliable sources, so there isn't any first-hand knowledge uh, and, and that's you know you know what i'm talking about it's like it's like you know, you're making sweeping politics, generalizations Glenn. politics in general like we we don't know what's going on on the back rooms we we don't know no, but we do see a lot of the other indicators though for sure but but there's always an enormous area where you know we just don't know the facts and uh, so, so that's, I think, a part of the reason why for some of these, you know, big discussions on political issues, it's, it's very difficult to speak truthfully because nobody, hardly anybody knows the truth. And the few people who know the truth aren't incentivized to tell the truth. So most people are just sitting on the outside and with opinions, right? You know what I'm saying? It's a difference. Yes, I, I think I get the thrust of what you're saying, but that's why I think we're in such dire straits. It used to be the job of the fourth estate, the, the media, the journalists, to do that job, to uncover truth, to publish what people did not want published. That was their job. Well, they haven't been... They haven't been, they've been completely all, blocked uh, by now. So they are not a reliable third-party source of authoritative, balanced reasoning and reporting. They've never been all of my life. I'm, I'm 43 years old. No, but it used to be much, saying, much better. It's gotten it went, much worse in the last 10 well, years. It, it, it's, it's been terrible all my life. No, you can't say that, Glenn. It's gotten oh, much, much worse. It, it, when, I was, when I was 12 years old, I already knew that the news is almost complete bullshit. And it was then and it still is now. And it's the same stuff then as now. It's cherry picked stories uh, from here and there. There's no connection. There's no purpose. It's just to entertain. It's one thing here. It's one thing there. It's, it's just crap. It, it, it got nothing to do with educating people about what's really happening. It's got nothing to do with providing useful information to make our lives better. You know, 
I don't know why it's like that, but I know it's been like that all my life. No question about it. Maybe it's a little worse now, but it's, it's not like this is something that just happened a few years ago. Like, yeah, it's, it's- If you take a look at the ownership of the news sources and news channels, that consolidation has been very recent in the last few decades. But before that, it was not nearly so consolidated. So there is a case to be made that before that consolidation, it had much more independent voice. Well, there's also a case to be made. There's many more independent voices today. With so none of them with the power of those kinds of media. None. A single Music. blogger today has a lot of work ahead of them to establish that kind of power and reach and credibility. Who, who has most viewers, Joe Rogan or CNN? Right. Joe Rogan. Right, but uh, is, anybody is, him a journalist? is anybody calling him a journalist? Well, he's a, he's a podcaster and he speaks to a lot of other podcasters. And together right. they have an- For profit. Well, they have an enormous audience, enormous, far bigger than mainstream media. But what is your claim? Are you claiming that journalism is going to be represented by people like Rogan? Well, I, I'm not saying, I, I'm just saying that, that that is a kind of an independent media, but it doesn't seem to be working any better, at, at least not when it comes to these political issues. And I think the fundamental reason is that most people are in the dark. We're, we're, we're just speaking about things we don't know any, we don't have firsthand knowledge about. And, uh, but it's a new media landscape for sure. And, but then in certain other fields, like let's say health, you can get very reliable information. For example, um, you know, many of the podcasts that provide uh, scientific uh, knowledge about health about sleep, about food, these kind of things. So that's a new media landscape as well, but it's, that's not politics, right? So it's a different thing. So I will admit that the existence of independent bloggers and writers, etc., makes it possible, possible what we're talking about and what you're talking about. But I'm talking about in practice, the reach of those people and the lack of curiosity in establishing veracity of epistemology of providence means that we don't normally do this now it is possible for let's say barry okay to write lots of articles on lots of topics and same with stacy okay so it could be possible for some very interested person in czechoslovakia to actually find them and compose a better model than what media is telling them based on what he uh, finds from Barry and Stacy, But that's very remote, remote possibility, and it's very unlikely because they're being drowned out. They're being really drowned out by the media, the money, the politics, the self-interest, the power, the influence, the celebrity of people like Rogan and others. So that is what's eroding what we know as any kind of journalism. There is no journalism we can actually point to today. You know, there's people on both sides saying, oh, they're biased, right? But if we actually look at where the facts come from, where the observations come from, where the reasoning comes from, where the science comes from, it is still possible to find that, but it's extremely difficult today and we don't have a platform on which that's easy or even appreciated. I could give an example. And uh, Stacey podcast. has here. Yeah, Andrew, just mentioned briefly, Andrew Huberman, he has a podcast. Uh, so he's a professor of neurobiology and he's created that podcast ju just because he wants to do education. So it's science education, but it's very health related. It's very practically related. And, and that's knowledge that can be scientifically verified, but it's also knowledge that can be personally verified. So if he comes with some practical tips, then you can try those things and you can see if it improves your quality of life. And that's an example of a kind of journalism that we do see and which does provide some pretty high quality information uh, about health related issues. 
But when it comes to politics, that's a whole different story. And uh, it, it's a different story because the whole field is inherently <coughs> filled with bullshit. And there's deep reasons for it. And I think we have to separate politics where there are incentives to lie that are built into the system. That has to be uh, differentiated from other fields like health-related issues, which are far more practically relevant for most people. That's interesting to know. It's far more relevant. That's also an area where it's much easier to get reliable sources of information. So that just wanted to point that out because it's a very important distinction. Okay, in your mind, so sorry, Stacy, I know your hand is up, but in your mind though, that point that you made about Huberman is exactly parallel and homologous to a point somebody else might make about ivermectin. No difference, no difference. What do you mean? Okay, so ivermectin if you only accept this superficial argument, then, you know, this tip versus that tip, you know, vaccines versus ivermectin, it's the same thing. You gotta go deeper to really understand that both are on different structures. One is on sand, the other is on concrete. Sure, okay. sure. Sorry, Stace, I went out of turn. It's really your turn. Well, first, I just want to confirm, DKR stands for Dynamic Knowledge Repository? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to have to agree with Sam that I think it's something like that's going to be necessary because even when we try, most human beings already have a bias, even when they're trying not to be biased. And there is no way they're going to include all the information that might take away from their point. It's just not going to happen. And certainly not a podcaster because they're already, you know, passionate about something. But if you go under to the information, which is what I try to do with people, even when I listen to people that, you know, believe Trump won, even if, if I mean, you know, if we want to go that far which I usually don't, but to figure out what's the information, actual, you know, verifiable information that even led to that framework for them. So I definitely think it has to be out of the hands of human beings because I don't think we're capable. Unless we're, and again, unless we can, and I think that was the reason for a two-party system, unless we can bring together reasonable people that have different views that can bring up the information in a way that we could all hear it. And I don't know that that's gonna happen so easily. You know, it can happen in small groups. And the other thing is when, the fairness doctrine. When did, when did that get ended in media? Reagan, Reagan ended it. And could you just say a little bit more about what that was? Yeah, the FCC way back, I'm not sure exactly, but maybe in the 60s, um, said that if one channel is putting on commentary, propo in promoting something, that you had to give the other side equal time. That was the fairness doctrine mandated by the FCC because of the public airwaves. That was the reason. And Reagan ended the fairness doctrine during his term, which is, what was his term in the 70s? Yeah. And it's never come back. So now the especially cable channels because they don't use the public airwaves so the fcc has almost no in influence over the cable channels so now you know you can have a channel that's you know completely biased but remember the newspapers were often politically biased you know you had a, a paper that was called the democrat because it was promoting the democratic or the liberal so newspapers were always and they were private they were always had the option of being politically biased and the public airwaves that was an issue that was an issue over the fairness doctrine which kind of goes away in the cable world unless the cable stuff is also being broadcast simultaneously so is there a question then about the incentive structures whether you have incentives to be truthful which seems to be very important here because i think that a guy like huberman he incentives to be truthful uh, and he can also point to his sources and he does 
and I think many of the people who listen to him, their incentives are just to, you know, have a better life. So my question to you first would be, and I don't know this Huberman person at all, but when he recommends something, does he get a kickback? What would you say? Uh, when he recommends something to his audience and that audience buys that product, does he get a kickback? Kick, no, he doesn't recommend any products. Well, I mean, he's, he's got a couple of ads, but, but apart from that, he doesn't go. recommend, but, but then he makes it clear these are ads, they're sponsoring the show, but he doesn't recommend specific products, but it, it's more behavioral protocols that he's focused on. Uh, so, um, so uh, you kick back, you mean that he gets uh, economic, yeah, yeah, right. No, it's it's a lot of it, a lot of behavioral things that he's focused on. Yeah. So to me, he seems very reliable, and it's a very interesting. Uh, I, I I've learned a lot from right. what like about sleep and yeah. I just want to jump in and say that there's an internal motivation because you're saying why you motivated the internal motivation wants to prove he's right about something. And that alone will bias somebody. And I'm not saying he's not right about what he's saying, but I'm just saying, be aware, that's a motivation as well. Be, you know, if you're scientific, you should probably not be so concerned about that. Oh yeah, because yeah, scientists thanks. don't have egos. <laughs> Can I respond, Stacey? Sure. I think let's say let's take a person, okay? Let's call that person maybe Glenn, okay? <laughs> and let's say that Glenn has a lot of information accumulated through life and believes a certain thing, right? I think that if you want to call that bias, I guess you could, but I'm I'm actually suggesting that's something very different than bias. And I think what bias, you know, really means to me is an unwillingness or a, a heavy inertia towards considering new information or new reasoning. Yeah, I don't mean bias. Let me change that to filters. They have a different set of filters because they've already filtered out a lot of information and that's closed off. Yeah, yes, we, we will all have filters of some kind that you know you can never be 100% sure about. But, but sometimes, let's say you have a lot of information about uh, the visual system, like Huberman's an expert in vision, for example, and, and uh, he, he speaks about how if you get outside in the morning and you get sunlight, then it starts something that's called the circadian rhythms, and it's going to have a, a, a major impact on the quality of your sleep. Um, so, so he's very concerned about, for example, he thinks it's very important to sleep well for, for various reasons and he gives a lot of advice. But to me, you know, the, the incentive structure there seems pretty clean in the sense that, you know, he has a lot of that knowledge. I'm pretty sure he wants that knowledge to be made useful. And if he can share that knowledge and people can have a better quality of life by by learning about it, you know, that, that's a win. And uh, it, it's a pretty clean incentive. One more thing, just one more thing. My question would be, how many people with platforms are like that? I think it's a small percentage. I think it's growing. It's, it's a new thing. It's several people who, yeah, I think it's a growing, it's one of the more positive developments. No, I'm not talking about the subject matter. I'm talking people with the disposition to be able to present things clearly and, and without you know bias. I think that's a small percentage of people that have that voice. All right. Maybe. But, but I think more there's more still... Yeah. What? Sam? Yeah, go, go ahead, Sam. And I think even with people like that, there's still a need for transparency because you know it's it's quite often that people who have high integrity, high ethics, a track record of you know really looking out for the people, citizens, are the ones that are targeted by those with power and money. 
to say, let's get that person to say what we want because he's got credibility, he or she, and has an audience. So I think until we actually get rid of that phenomenon, these people still need to be studied, validated, examined, sure. Sure. pursued, inquired upon. But I think they would agree. Like if they have integrity, they would agree. Yep. That if I come with a claim and it's wrong, I want people to tell me I'm wrong. Right, so my point is, how do we do that though? Right now, we don't have a way to do that other than somebody posting a blog and saying, that person's wrong. But we don't have this interconnect of facts, of evidence, of supporting arguments, contradicting arguments, you know, clear, rational, commentary, review, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have that. The best example of that is attempted in academia. We certainly don't have that across all of you know society, not at all. Barry, you had your hand up. Yeah, I actually wanted to go all the way back to uh, the concept of what you could get out of a lie detector test if you had a, a very good lie detector test. And so one of the things you might ask a person under a lie detector is, um, you honestly believe what you just asserted? Or more precisely, what's your degree of belief or your confidence that what you asserted will turn out to be the ground truth? Because we have concepts in our head and most of our concepts are not comprehensive, accurate knowledge. They're partial knowledge. They may have gaps in them typically. Uh, they may have simplifications in them and they may have misconceptions mixed in. And so what you have in your head is sort of a, is a melange of accurate information, gaps and misconceptions. And so when you assert something, it's not necessarily true or false. It's, it's got some truth and some in, misinformation or disinformation mixed into it. So what, what would happen, what I think would happen with um, lie detectors is you would drill down to degrees of belief where you were, which is what scientists say. Scientists will make a, an assertion and put a confidence interval on it, a real number. And politicians will almost never do that. What would happen is we would begin to assign probabilities or degrees of belief or levels of confidence. And that says that, for example, I might say, there are two uh, competing theories of, how, of the origin of life. One is that life originated on this planet by some abiogenesis process, some chemical process that evolved a life, or panspermia, that living organisms arrived on cometary dust. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, well, both of them are plausible. I don't know which one is gonna turn out to be the true story, and over time, my degree of belief has migrated from abiogenesis towards panspermia. Pieces of little bits of evidence coming in over the time. So a scientist will, will present both their favorite hypothesis, which can be a simplification, maybe easy to understand, and then some alternatives and, and assigned degrees of belief. And that's now when you, when you say, put them on a lie detector, now you're saying, are your estimates of your degrees of belief, you know, genuine? Is that your your real is that your real confidence level? Or are you fudging the confidence level? So, <clears throat> the real value is: can we assign real reasonable degrees of belief to competing hypotheses? And how how comprehensive is my knowledge? Are there gaps or misconceptions that I don't yet appreciate that I haven't delved into? And then. What questions can be asked that would illuminate the gaps and the misconceptions? Sam. To me, that's one factor and it's not even the best factor. I think it's a simple factor. And I don't mean that to be a contradictory, okay? I do think that it's useful to, for, to, for you to propose that. But what I find more useful is to actually build that reasoning structure underneath each claim. And then you can say, if this and this and this, then this. And then I can go and test each of those supporting points. And those are the intervention points. If one of them is a big question, okay, like, is the universe expanding or not? Okay, then you can say, well, you know, that could take us a number of different ways. And there's lots of things that are affected once that particular claim goes this way or that way. Okay. 
So to me, the number to me is not as important. Like for example, I would not necessarily adopt a belief or claim that had a higher confidence for someone. Because that person could be saying, I believe in God with 100% certainty. I'd much rather believe somebody that says, there's a 78% chance that this is true, and there's an 83% that's chance that's true. I would more likely listen to that person. So this confidence number takes some skill and understanding to even use. Right, exactly. It obviously depends what kind of questions we're trying to answer. And there's some questions where it's very difficult to even, even understand what the question means. Like, does God exist is a great example. What do we even mean by God? And already then, we're probably at a question which is unanswerable. But, but if we're speaking about something very specific, um, then, then, you know, you could imagine cases where you could formulate a really good question like how confident are you that that this really happened and then maybe if you had a lie detected test that could be a case where those cases would be resolved so i don't think every could be resolved but you could resolve quite a number of cases that, that would be important and i'll call i would also include this larger system you're describing Sam of, a, of knowledge repository that that would also be uh, I hadn't really thought of it like that before but you could say, see that as a kind of a lie detection system or a truth verification system it wouldn't answer all questions but it could answer quite a few and it could more importantly useful. it could ask a lot of good questions that as well yeah it could um Like, for example, whether ivermectin, you know, works against COVID, that's a question that should be answerable. Already, by now, there's a lot of people who took it. We should be able to look at the data. Yes. And I, I, I think it has been answered by those who know that it doesn't seem to work especially well, but maybe just... will work in some cases. So. Yeah, I disagree that it's been answered because there are still some people that believe in it, that believe it works. But what I'm saying is it is possible that under some circumstances, under the right conditions, it works for whatever reason. And I think that goes to about, about reliability. So if I said, do we believe, do you believe, or is there a power greater than the individual. Most people will say there is something greater, some greater power. Some might say no. And then, you know, you could ask questions, well, how might this happen? Or the question could be, is there an interconnection between the inhabitants of the planet? And you could start there but all the possibilities come out and then you can look and see what's supported. Sam? So I'll say for those who are willing to define their terms, I'm willing to lean in, okay? If somebody's willing to define God or define deities or define greater power, I'm there with them. The slippery people, the squirrely people are those who do not want to define terms. Right. Those are the people you have to be wary of. Well, that's where I think the lie detector would come in because I don't think, I think there are a lot of people that, you know, they call themselves religious, but if you really question them, how much do you believe that this happened? I don't think they really, I, I don't no. think they really believe it. The fundamental thing is the truth doesn't matter whether person A believes it or not. No, it doesn't. That has no bearing on the truth. So that's why I say that has no bearing on the utility of a lie detector. The lie detector I'd rather see is the DKR, not whether or not somebody's pulse goes up. That's useless to me. People are deluding that's, themselves daily. 
Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> always <laughs> not a lie. <laughs> that's always yeah. not a good draw yeah. lie detector. Jay. I just wanted to yeah. mention you said that define your terms. That that's obviously one thing, but then you also have the cases like for me, for example, where when I would use the word God, I would be very reluctant to define that because I, I deliberately use that word as a reference to a mystery. So it's by definition undefined. But but again, that's a very special way. You can always be right. Yeah, but, but that's a special case, right? So oh, that is there's case. also those cases. Yeah, so, but that's a good example of that there's some questions where you actually deliberately don't want to give a definition. You, not me. I'm willing to define God however you want to discuss God, but if you want to change that definition no matter what we discuss, that's squirrely, that's slippery. I can give an example. If I define God as an, I would define it as an infinite, eternal, super intelligent something or, or super intelligence, right? Uh, super intelligent power, let's say uh, an infinite, eternal, super intelligent power. So you hear me say those words. So maybe you ask, okay, so what is that? And that's where I would say, I have absolutely no idea and neither do you nor anybody else because if you have an idea then it wouldn't be that okay so, so it's one of those way, i will define god as the flying spaghetti monster <laughs> what is the difference well then i could say i don't believe in it exactly. <laughs> then, then i know that that's something i definitely don't believe Right. I could do the same thing with a infinite, eternal, super intelligent power. What do you mean? I didn't understand. What does that have to do with the spaghetti? In other words, they have the same truthiness. No, no I'm saying if I believe that there actually exists an infinite, eternal, super intelligent power, then it it's natural for me to assume that I have no idea what that is. So no. in other words, in, in a, any practical sense, that is a mystery to me. No. So it is. It's a super It's a mystery to you, not to me. If it's super intelligent, then it's beyond any of our capabilities of understanding it. Okay. That's the point. The whole point is if it's... Yeah, but just because you define something doesn't mean that it exists. <laughs> you know, that's I not find the, that... That's not the point. The point I'm That is the is, point. That is exactly the point. I'm not making a claim of whether it exists or not. I'm saying if something like that exists, then it is a mystery to us. That's what I'm saying. Barry? The mystery is that if such a, a being exists, why isn't it writing Wikipedia and, and articles on the internet so as to share its super intelligent knowledge with the rest of it? It's a mystery it why such a creature would I mean, educators go out and they educate. You know, they, you know, professor, you profess your knowledge and you share it. <clears throat> why wouldn't the, you know, the, the, you know, the cosmo, cosmo, uh, cosmological professor not profess by, you know, putting all this stuff out on YouTube and on Wikipedia and everywhere else. Why are we here from it? Well, well that's, a, that's a kind of a rhetorical question that can have all kinds of answers. One of them could be that there's certain reasons why it would want us to figure it out ourselves. Glenn, you can label that question rhetorical just like I can label that definition rhetorical. Well, how could you though? If it good. was, I'm just saying, if there existed something that was, I'm not talking about a super AI here, okay? I'm talking about something that's orders of magnitude uh, bigger and deeper and smarter than that. Like infinitely uh, and eternal. If, if something like that exists, how could we even begin to imagine what it would be like? Easy. 
We make observations. We take each of these terms, infinite, eternal, super intelligent, and power, and we figure out what those terms mean, i.e. we define them. We actually understand the domain of discourse, and we can actually draw implications on each of those, and then we can actually say, okay, so if this thing existed, here are the implications. But if you're not willing to define those terms, we can't have that conversation. And when we then figure out that we can't understand the infinite because yeah, that's your assumption. So finite, your assumption is that we cannot understand the infinite. That is not necessarily a fact. How can you how can you imagine something that doesn't have any? Easy. Limits? I give it a symbol. I find out what characteristics it has. But the symbol I look is at it logically. But the symbol is not a thing. No, it's not. But you can actually reason with symbols. We do it all the time. Yeah, but it doesn't work with those things. Yes, it does. The, Every time you learn through language, you've learned through symbols. But that's trying to reduce something limitless to something limited. Don't you see you're making a fundamental You're not reducing anything. Yeah, there's no reduction there. And even if there were, why would that be invalid? I'm just saying you're trying to reduce something in. I'm not trying anything. I'm using my faculties. Yes, and those and faculties to are God-given faculties. And those faculties are limited. So what? Therefore, how could they grasp something unlimited? They can grasp in limited ways. What's the problem with that? Gay or Tanner did. Exactly. I could have a primitive thermometer as it existed 200 years ago. It's nowhere near as good as a thermometer today, and yet it still gave useful results. Yes, What's invalid about that? But what does that have to do with a super intelligent power? I'm saying you're saying that something cannot be investigated by something that's finite. And I'm saying, yes, it can. I'm Even saying though humans that. are finite, they can go out and make observations about whatever this place is that we call the universe. Yes, but can we grasp an infinite See, eternal super term. intelligent What does grasp powers? mean? What does yeah. interpret mean? This is where this conversation needs to go. Otherwise, it's being slippery. But can I point, ask that everybody yeah, take a breath? Can we? I'm, no, I'm going to yeah, get back and, to the start. I'm going to get back to the start because the start was this is slippery, Sam, and there's no way out of the slipperiness. And that's the whole point. That's the assumption. There's certain right. questions that are by their nature unresolvable, they're mysteries. And this is an that's example your assumption. Of it. Well, it's a mystery from the beginning. It's that's your assumption. The, if it's you want to assume assumption. that, fine. That's true in your world, maybe. But if those we, are assumptions. There are if axioms. We call something there are axioms super we intelligent. <laughs> if we call Even something that, super Glenn, you're intelligent. Very slippery. You're very slippery, Glenn. Sam, if you call something super intelligent, doesn't that already presume it to be more intelligent than you and thus impossible for you to grasp. define the term first i just did no you mystery. didn't you just gave it a symbol that's all you did no i designed it as a mystery <laughs> okay glenn i, I don't mean, think we're going to get very far because you're not defining your terms Stacey, the but, I, but, I, but i'm going back to the beginning i'm anti-defining the term that's yes, the point so you don't want to be reasonable you don't want to reason with well, your it's terms. reasonable Right? But you put a lot of reasons with your terms. And that's what I'm saying. I can't lead into this if you're not willing to reason and define your terms. Because it's not even true. You haven't even it's tried. It's mystery. I, I, I'm not going to try an impossible thing. I'm not making a term. It's not a proposition. God is not a proposition. It's a verbal reference to a mystery. God exists is a proposition. Yes, but I didn't make that. I'm saying the word itself. Then, then why are we talking about God then? I'm just saying that to speak about that in terms of a proposition is totally meaningless. And this is something all uh, dogmatic religious people have not grasped. And it's something that many materialists have not grasped, grasped and which the mystics have understood. And that's why they're mystics. 
because they understand that this this is a whole topic matter which by its nature goes beyond all definitions and therefore we can't think about it in a propositional way so the whole activity of trying to have a propositional debate about terms which aren't terms at all they're and what are they what do you call god is god not a symbol to you it's a reference to a mystery. A reference is a symbol, Glenn. It's a symbol which points beyond the symbol. No, that's your assumption. That's, that's the whole point with the symbol. It's not about the symbol. It's like a symbol that says, this is not it. You can this actually say it. the thing that the symbol points to, you can actually characterize in some limited way. And you're not doing that. And that completely missing the point from the beginning. Okay. To try to characterize it in a limited no. way. Because so, so this, you're saying that you can actually have a mystery that I will never understand, whereas I am curiously leaning into it and I'm not finding anything I can grasp and understand. Yes, that, that's the point of a mystery. That it's certain types of mysteries, which from the beginning, are understood in such a way that they can't be grasped. Okay, that I would be say an example of it. that the mysteries that I see that are asked by the cosmos, asked by Carl Sagan, asked by Einstein, asked by the greatest artists are much more rich to me than fantasies of symbols that cannot ever be described or leaned into. I'd much exactly. rather go into those mysteries. I'd rather look at mysteries of, you know, what the James Webb telescope is going to divulge in the next 10 years, or what, you know, some of the best, you know, physicists in the world are going to discover than some meaningless mystery, which no one is even willing to characterize to me. Sure, but then we're on to a different question. Because no, it's the same saying, question. Yeah, but then you're saying, okay, I understand what you're saying, Glenn, but that's not a mystery that's interesting to me. And that's fine. No, you're not okay? even defining why that mystery is interesting to anyone other than you. It's like a, it's like a koan. It's, it's something that... Koans have use. utility. They're not mysteries. Okay, I, I, can, I can answer that. Why is it interesting to me? It's because it's a koan. It's like a koan. It expands my mind. It, it, it helps my mind to go beyond its current limitations to contemplate about something that is limitless. And where I know I will never succeed in grasping it, but it still fascinates me to contemplate it but it's a contemplation that's different from a contemplation that tries to find an answer. So it's a contemplation of a mystery. You're not trying to find an answer because it's obviously impossible to find an answer, but it can still be interesting to contemplate a mystery. Stacy. Well, first, I just want to say, I don't think it's impossible to find an answer to a mystery. That's the first thing. But um, I was watching um, a prof um, So his name is Avi Loeb. He's an Israeli American theoretical physicist. He worked on astrophysics and cosmology. Um, and he's actually talking about um, a very real possibility that there are visitors coming from other planets. Now, this is an example of a topic that would not even be discussed for the longest of times that everybody would, that's just crazy, it's off, it, prove it, do this, and you couldn't prove it, at least way back. But there is information and some of it may be hidden and it's at least worthy of looking at instead of saying, which is what's been said in the past, it was a rock. It was this, it was that. So the idea of the mystery is, yes, maybe, maybe it can't be, you know, maybe it can't be seen, maybe it can, but that's also part of the mystery. But you still have to collect all of the different information. And I just want, you know, that's it. <laughs> that's all I want to say. Of course. There's also different degrees of mysteries, right? 
I was speaking about mystery with a big M here, like the ultimate mystery. Like for me, an infinite, eternal, super intelligent power would be something like an ultimate mystery. Like the, if I believe I can grasp that as a concept, come on. But do you believe, but maybe when you die, then you get to, then you get to understand it. I mean, again, there's still maybe, 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 maybe there's always maybes. But like a maybe, maybe is a maybe. <laughs> maybe I could somehow come into a union with it or something, but it wouldn't be a conceptual understanding, that's for sure. And I think this is, this is so often overlooked in these discussions. It's, it's really frustrating for me when I see, listen to Christians and atheists, for example, talk about it and, and they're totally ignoring this point. They're totally ignoring the fact that they don't actually know what the topic is. <laughs> That's kind of the point. It's like I saw Lawrence. You know what the topic is, Glenn. I know, but at least I know that I don't know what it is. No, but you're so authoritative. You're telling everyone else that they don't know what the topic is. Of course they don't. According to you. Come on, give me a break. The, the, we humans who can't even control our brains for one minute are supposed to grasp the deepest nature of something that has existed forever and has no limit in time nor space. Have we made any progress in 20,000 years? Sure, we made a lot of pro yeah. progress. That's my case. But I, I think we're still not closing in on that, at least not in any conceptual understanding. That, that's an absurdity by itself to be able to grasp something like that as an idea. That, that would be like trying to fit the solar system inside of your pocket. It would be even, even more extreme than that. But, but it, it was funny though, because I saw a discussion between Lawrence Krauss and Craig, who is this theologian, and they discussed this issue about the origin of existence. And they both had their different explanations. Craig called it God, and Krauss called it the multi-universe. But it was very interesting to me that it was so similar, you know, because they both agreed that they didn't understand what it was. They, 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 they didn't give it any specific characteristics. They didn't really want to say anything more about it. Just Craig called it God. Krauss called it the multiverse. It was infinite, eternal, in both cases totally mind-blowing. Were they both super intelligent? Both of those two. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them that, but what do I know? I, mean, means, just... I think you meant Sam. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you mean the two ideas, right? Yes. I, they, they would definitely both be because in an infinite, super intelligent? in an infinite eternal multiverse, for example, you will all already presume there's intelligent life, but there's all, there will also be an infinite amount of intelligent life that has evolved for an eternity. So you will have super intelligence in a multiverse. Okay, so I could believe in n-grams, I could believe in four trillion uh, year contracts, I could believe in... Um... Evolution. No, I'm, I'm specifically citing the you know, basic tenets of Scientology. They would have the same credibility, essentially. But you believe in evolution? Yes. So, so you believe that over time, some things in nature evolve towards greater intelligence. Because then it seems to me that if, if, if we believe in evolution and we believe that there's an infinite eternal multiverse, then necessarily we'll have to believe that intelligent evolution has gone on forever. Yeah, I hold that open as a possibility, but I would first question what you mean by infinite and eternal. Yeah. That's I'm not willing to lean into those definitions and I can't you know, have a constructive conversation about that. 
I think the best I could offer would simply be that it never had a beginning. It just has been going on and it doesn't have any end. It, it just goes on and on and on and on. Right, both of which presume understanding of time. And time itself is undergoing some very deep investigation. And we're learning more and more about time as, as science evolves. So couldn't we agree that that's part of the mystery as well, whether or not sure. it's infinite Science or not? has a lot of mysteries, but they can sure. define them. They can pursue them. They can observe aspects of them. That's the difference. We can define up to a point. Yes, of course. So let's do that. And I, th I think we're trying to do that, but, but you sort of come to a point where you understand that maybe all your definitions are kind of essentially meaningless. No, because they allow us to ask questions. They allow us to refine those definitions over time. So the refusal to define is kind of a refusal to even start that process. So we, we can use definitions, but it's like it's our definition. So right? it's a subjective it's thing. Day, right? You have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere for sure. So it's useful to at least okay colin's got his hand up yeah can you hear me yes yep um it seems that um when one's not certain then they shouldn't be acting certain that's the problem for me so you're allowed to wonder all you want but how much time and effort and resources can you put into that especially after you've already put a bunch in and it's not seeming to move any further. You can't do everything. Some things you're interested in, some things you have to drop. And I think what Sam is saying, unless you could present more after all this time we've been together, it's hard to find the next, um, what's next, I guess. That's something I like to say, you know, if you can figure out what's next, then you're on the journey, right? Ready to make a mistake. But if you don't know what's next, you can't even make a mistake. And then when you're over certain and you claim, well, you, you know, you switch the burden of proof on people and say, well, therefore I'm justified because you can't prove me wrong. Then, then you're in, um, you're in a manipulation situation. So you have to decide whether, you know, maybe that manipulation is good. Like if you're going to go to the beach, you said, well, I don't know if it's going to rain tomorrow. I said, well, you can't prove me wrong. If the sun isn't coming out. Let's get ready to go. So, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's of no harm, no foul, maybe a little bit of time wasted, other changing laws and, 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 and the trend is to move away from that, which is something that I like to point out to people who seem to still have a large amount of certainty. They won't even agree that they've already lost ground in some of their ideas and mythologies. And they're still pulling this game of manipulation while you can't prove me wrong. That's when it gets nasty. So... It's yeah. the second or third time around when you're having convivial conversations that you run into real problems. You know, people who don't even want to talk to each other is another kind of problem that I'm not even mentioning. Like, how do you get people to the table to discuss? I think that's more of a Stacy realm thing where she gets all these different people and how do you, I don't know, she's, she's done some experimenting. We've all done some experimenting in this kind of thing, but it comes down to bias and I think in uh, having a way to, you know, um, take stock and what you can figure out to do next. And if you, if there's nothing you can do next, and at least two can agree that there's nothing we can do next. So don't look at me like I should be doing something next, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Sam. Thanks, Colin. I would ask again the question and ask it in two ways. Imagine a world described and explained by religion. Imagine a world described and explained by all we know about science. There are many things that are attempted to be explained by religion, especially over the last several thousand years, that now have very rich, very verifiable, very evidence-filled explanations in science. And so one would argue that those insights, those perspectives give us 
new appreciation for the beauty, the complexity, the workings, the dynamics, the kinetics of the universe, of God, of nature, everything, right? But how many problems have been better explained by religion than by science? Transformation of consciousness. Transformation not, of consciousness. Not better. Science is actually pursuing those questions right now. Yeah, but, but it's not an explanation. It's, an, it's, a, it's a practice. No, they're actually experimenting and trying to understand the theoretical under, uh, underpinnings of consciousness. But are they so practicing science is going after that question. Are they Religion has never gone after that question. It is said, I know what it is, and I will tell you what it is, and you're not able to question me. Sam, that's right. what, science, that's a, that's, what science is practicing the transformation of being? What science is practicing that? If I go to university and I want to go to the department, define trans transformation of being. Transformation cognitive of behavioral the whole, therapy. Yes, cognitive, behavioral, spiritual, physical, social transformation Spiritual's towards being a, a better, being a better person in general. You don't think the that's being investigated at all? I'm not. Glenn, I, come on. But is it being practiced? Absolutely. It's but being I, taught. It's being in workshops. There's lots of studies on this. The whole history is this. Yeah, but it's... How does it's that not, not get appreciated by you? Uh, well, I, I see it's being practiced, but it seems to me that what we call science is more uh, about theoretical explanations no. than it is about practice. Okay. Yeah, you have a lot of preconceptions about what's like. Okay, so tell different. me, where, where do I go to find personal transformation? In the find transformation first. Okay, because there's lots of transformations. I've learned how to do certain skills. I've learned new insights. I've learned how to meditate. I've learned how to do Tai Chi. I've learned how to you know, understand philosophy. I've understood lots of these things. These are all transformations, Glenn. Okay, so let me ask a different question on no, I want you to find your term because this is what I mean by being squirrely. This is what I mean by being squirrely. No, and just I'll, ignore the, that anybody else's hand has been up. Ignore I'll, that. I'll answer the question briefly. Uh, psychology, you can take a doctor's degree in psychology without even learning to be conscious of your own thoughts, without practicing mindfulness. How is that possible? How is it possible to become a professor of psychology without having a long practice in mindfulness? To me, it's strange. It's strange that someone can become a PhD in psychology without having a mandatory training in mindfulness. That's strange. It's not strange. It is. So I think it is strange, and it goes to the point that I wanted to raise, which was, Sam, you, you proposed, you know, the two ways to look at things. And what I want to say is there's a third way, and why don't we use the third way? So when have, have we had science look to religion as if it's a story and see what it might have been pointing to? So not science to asks that all the time. Excuse me? Science asks that question all the time. Science might, but scientists don't always. Because some oh of them... <laughs> what, what, Colin? Oh my. That, that so where, is, where is this science you speak about, Sam? Where is yeah, it? Science is a process. It's not a person. person yes, it's not a person. It's not an institution. It's a way of thinking. Okay, so where is it? It can exist in anyone. Person? Okay, so let me give you an example. Sam's okay. a little annoyed. You guys, you guys are wooing him too much. Now let's, let's here. I'm, I'm, the game. Game. I'm in the game Sam. now. Okay. Sam, am I wooing you? No. Okay. Thank you. Let's That's go. my impression. That's my impression. <laughs> right, which was wrong. But what's um, your degree of belief in that impression? So, so I confirm that hypothesis. I stick. I stick to my statement. That was scientific, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my point. Okay. So let's talk about like psychic phenomena. So I've seen experiments where scientists try to either prove or disprove that somebody has an ability. Yep. To me, 
it's much more valuable if I got a few so-called psychics together yep. and had them discuss yep. the different experiences. And that's been done scientifically. And where is that information? Why hasn't it been pushed to the forefront? Okay, Why you know how much money the CIA actually spent on studies like this? Do you know how much money oh, the Russians have spent on studies like this? There is, but it's in, secret. Including experiments on how sound can really drive somebody crazy. Yes, I, you I got- said something interesting, Sam. CIA, that's secret. That's some of my point. Yes. The science of which you speak doesn't exist. The fact that it's funded by the CIA doesn't mean that it's not science, okay? The science of which you speak is the science I would want to see, which is a transparent science where we share this data with the public. Yes, I'd love to see that data also, and it's gradually coming to light, okay? Yeah, but I, I would, would say... Would I be allowed that, to speak or no? This is Josh. Yeah, go for I, it. I, sure. I had my hand it. up. I didn't see your hand, Josh. No, no yeah. problem. It's okay. Everyone's getting heated. I was just how, I've just been listening, and I, I don't want to argue, but I do want to work together in dynamic knowledge repository, cite your sources. Let's all work together and show each other. You can't yell at each other on a Zoom screen. Let's all just take some time and learn and show each other. I think we are doing that. Yeah. I think we are. Or the CIA, where it has to be taken later on with the, you know, you've got to ask the government to show you its hand you know let's just share knowledge jeez louise i love all you guys okay i'm done go ahead keep arguing yep yeah foia is going to be uh, quite valuable but you know it's still being fought by a lot of people okay yeah, FOIA just, in the u.s means the freedom of information act okay but just, just wish, briefly to to channel this in I think that the science of which you speak, Sam, is, is just the thing I want to see. I think it's what many people want to see, but I think it's being underestimated that this doesn't really seem to exist at any scale. It seems that what is typically called science is a lot of very specialized institutions who research very specialized subjects, very often incredibly theoretical, and this sort of general science for a good life and for personal transformation, it doesn't exist today. It could exist. There exist seeds of it here, there, but it, it doesn't really but, exist. Glenn, the library, people, the library, publications, look for it. There's a lot of it out there. Don't say it, it doesn't exist. Josh, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Also, let's just be aware of who we're talking to. <laughs> I mean, you, you went to Stanford, Sam. You work in a science field. You know a lot of things we can share. Glenn lives in a different country than America. He doesn't have the biases of Americans. He doesn't have the same news as Americans. He's got different news sources. They might be owned by people that happen to be American. But we all have a different perception and different understandings of different truths. And the best thing I think you can do is cite the sources, explain it if you can. And sometimes it takes a long time. It could be hours. I was listening to a very intellectual yeah. conversation on cognitive understanding from a scientist who has studied it so deeply that it's it's terms that would take me years to even understand about cognition and the computer recursive knowledge, blah, blah, blah. It takes time to explain a six year doctorate degree in a specific subject. I just hope we're just gentle with each other. That's all I wanted to say. And thank you for letting me use my hand. I appreciate it. Can I read what Barry put in the chat and then let him add? <laughs> He says, I define intelligence as a rational form of information processing, which reduces the entropy or uncertainty of the knowledge base, generates solutions to un outstanding problems, and conceives goal oriented courses of action. Barry, you want to add to that? <laughs> Just say that when back on 20 minutes ago, when Sam and Glenn are arguing over whether words like intelligence have definitions. I just want to point out that I wrote that definition, not just now, I wrote that definition maybe 10 years ago. I actually wrote it 
<clears throat> in the context of thinking versus worrying, but uh, I substituted the word intelligence for thinking in that uh, <clears throat> revision of the definition. Sam? Yeah. Okay, so um, two things. I will actually uh, study your definition because I don't quite grok it yet. But to me, it's interesting that two words don't exist in that definition. One is truth, the other is problem. Oh, sorry, wait, problem does exist. Sorry, it, does, it is there. But truth is not there. Correct. Now, I have, and I'm no theoretician in this area, but my understanding of intelligence is the ability to solve problems. Yes. That's one way to look at the intelligence, okay? And so intelligence is testable. Intelligence is actually experimentable, okay? So whatever definition allows that, I'm willing to work with and uh, pursue, okay? The other is, Josh, your notion of being gentle with each other. I believe I've been gentle for close to four years. And I look at whether or not that's actually gotten us closer to truth, closer to mutual sense-making, closer to co-visioning. And I think that without proper appreciation for truth and for reasoning and for science, I don't see much progress towards that truth, towards that co-visioning, towards that uh, sense-making. And that's why I've ratcheted up my level of energy around these themes of truth, of sense-making, of science recently. And by recently, I mean probably the last six to 12 months, okay? And I think that it's doing so because I've seen that this acceptance of tectonically unstable foundations of belief don't lead us anywhere, not enough anyway. And so I'm looking for firmer ground. That's the part of barn raising and foundation laying that is the foundation laying. So I've consciously done that in the last six to 12 months, over. I'm gonna quickly add on, Sam, uh, take the word gentle and change it to this phrase. Pull me in, don't push me out. Share with me the knowledge that you have and your understanding. Don't tell me I'm wrong. I'm actually doing this. I'm doing this in such a way because I didn't say you weren't. I didn't say you weren't. I, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with it. So people who actually don't appreciate truth will not gravitate towards what I'm saying. People who do appreciate truth will shift in towards what I'm saying. That's how I'm doing it. Over. The, the notion of true and false kind of dates back to Aristotelian logic and the modern version of binary or Boolean logic. And what's interesting is that there are many propositions which cannot be classified as 100% true or 100% false. And in fact, Gödel's theorem and uh, related research reveals why Boolean or binary logic is not is an incomplete method right. of analysis of the, uh, of the utility or, or veracity of, of propositions. And Way back, I think in the 1950s or 60s, uh, there came uh, something called fuzzy logic, which is now called continuous valued logic, in which instead of assigning a proposition, a truth value of zero or one and nothing in between, you now can assign it a truth value anywhere between zero and one, or if you wanna go negative minus one to definitely false. And there's a whole mathematics of continuous valued logic, which is more powerful and more useful than Boolean or binary logic because a lot of propositions, we cannot ascertain that they're definitely true or definitely false. We, we, we may have a degree of belief that's close to one or close to minus one that's almost surely false, but the ability to take new information in and do a Bayesian update, which is another powerful tool in mathematics, all allows us to assign degrees of belief to propositions which we cannot um, affirmatively assert to be definitely true or definitely false. That's why I don't use true and false, except in the context of Boolean logic or binary logic, Aristotelian logic. Aristotle had, had this axiom of the excluded middle, that if it's not true, it must be false. If it's not false, it must be true. And that axiom That's of the, the middle got, got, got eliminated with the introduction of continuous valued logic and hybrids. Hybrids are another example of uh, 
sort of inventing the <clears throat> a lot of a lot of really good engineering is inventing the excluded middle, <laughs> previously excluded middle. Mm, that's interesting. So I think that fuzzy logic slash continuous values of truth is an approximation. It's a useful approximation, but I'm proposing something that's actually even more useful in my view. Okay. And that's the the rich interconnect of claims, evidence, and reasoning. That, if you perform some aggregate numerical analysis on, can give you this value that you're looking for, this fuzzy value. But what's valuable is not the number itself. It's this rich substructure of interconnects, of contradictions, of counterclaims, of evidence, of supporting facts, of countering facts, et cetera. That's more valuable because that allows us to test at each of these points of intervention and look at what happens if this is not true. And then boom, okay, lots of implications. That is more useful than any kind of fuzzy logic or continuous value kind of truth. Yeah. That's where I'm leaning with DKRs and DDKRs. I'm a big fan of Bayesian inference, even though I am very clumsy at using it. I make, I routinely make mathematical errors trying to use Bayes' theorem. And then there's common filtering, which is sort of a special case of updating um, information from trickling in evidence. So these are all very modern uh, mathematical concepts. They're very powerful, but also they're very specialized. You, you need a subject matter specialist expert to employ these techniques. And even, you know, fully educated ph physicists screw up Bayesian inference. The Monty Hall problem is a classical example of people not being able to do Bayesian inference on a kindergarten level problem. That guy, uh, Nate Silver, uh, you know, the, what's, I forget the name of this organization, five post one or something. He's a, he is very, very rigorous in doing things like Bayesian inference. And he's, he's a national treasure because almost nobody can pull off what he does and calculate probabilities with the, that kind of uh, intricate precision. So I, I wanna bring this all back to conversations, which is always part of the focus, even if we don't state it that way. Um, I had put up a question on, on my wall about, I wanted to know who understood the phrase you know the problem with the metaverse, but part of the the part of that interaction that I wanted to share is there was a very knowledgeable person, and he put four comments there, and it was like a well written essay. So the first paragraph was an introduction, then he got specific in two different parts, and then the fourth one he wrapped it up. So the first part of what he said, I agreed totally, and I understood it. The second part of what he said, I couldn't agree or disagree because I didn't have enough of an understanding. I hadn't had a chance to weigh the different possibilities or to know the facts or to see how it landed for me. The same with the next paragraph. The last paragraph, again, I totally understood, which was the reason for my interest in the topic to begin with. So what I'm saying is, if we slowed it down, the first paragraph, I totally agreed. I don't know if other people agree because there were many people, bright, really smart people that didn't even know what the term was in the first place or what it was referring to, which was the point of my post originally. How do we define the question in a way that invites people into it? Because sometimes you see a question and you think, Oh, I have nothing to add to that. But the truth is I have a lot to add to the first and the fourth, and that's what drew me in. Now I need a space where I could observe and ask questions so that I know if I agree with the second or third, because maybe I don't. And if we want collective intelligence, we have to bring in all the voices, and this goes to Colin's filters, maybe not in the way he presents it. But I would love to go back to that post, start with the first paragraph and even the last paragraph, which worked together, which basically said why the conversation's important in the first place. But before I agree with numbers two and three, 
I want to know more. I want to ask questions. I want to find out what information the other person may have been overlooking. I'm complete. Was that the post about the, the meta crisis? Correct. And the Bye. reason I posted that is because I listened to a really good podcast with um, Daniel Schmachtenberger and everything he said was very clear, except when he first said what he was going to describe, I thought to myself, I don't think people even understand the question. Of course, after you listen to the whole podcast, I mean, at least for me, I was like, yes, absolutely. He, you know, he can represent me on that topic. Um, mm. Yeah. He's your subject matter expert on that. Exactly. Uh, Sam? I'm glad you actually say, said that very last statement, which is he can represent me on that topic. One of my notes that I put in here as a possible discussion topic Here's was... Take computer it. stop was the horribleness of majority voting of elections by majority vote so if we actually have more proxy holding as in you know on this issue i give daniel my proxy so he can represent me okay on another issue maybe urban planning i give it to someone else that to me is a way to really support the people that you agree with and for better solutions to be co-created rather than everything being kind of this you know might makes right business i'd much rather see that and further on that point there's uh, suggestions of something which is called <laughs> Condorcet voting. I don't know how many guys have actually seen this, but those are systems in which rather than just saying, okay, of these six, I'm gonna vote for this one. It's basically a pairwise thing of saying, between these two, I prefer this one. And you do all the pairwise selection say, between those two, I prefer that one. And there's a way to then get much better, quote unquote, decisions if you don't just trivialize it to a majority wins. And there's at least six other proposals and probably an infinite uh, number proposed beyond that, of which, by the way, Global Sim is my response to it. So anyway, that's what I really pick up on in your comment, which is he can represent me on this issue, which I think brings up the, how do we get more scalable decision-making slash co-creation across society election systems being one of the worst possible areas in which it, it's being applied over. So is the topic matter than what would be a, an alternative, better election system? Is that kind of the topic? That could be a huge topic, yes, which I just introduced. I, I, I'll just throw out a, an idea I've had. I haven't developed this idea very far yet. But it's an idea that imagine if you have a certain society of a certain group where you could have a system where a decision is only made when 100% of the people say yes to it. Um, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure how it could work. I have to work more on this idea. But the basic idea is to have a system which selects for solutions that are so good that everyone will get behind them um, might not work on very huge scales but i guess we could imagine it could work with groups of let's say a couple of hundred people something like that maybe or an alternative could be of course that as a decision is made if 95 percent plus wants it but uh, yeah, that's it's a big topic, so I don't really know. Uh, in my view, that creates huge log jams. Even by super majority requirements in you know the uh, amendment process, we've got a log jam in the U.S. So you know, if you demand ninety-five percent, that's that's even worse. Well, I, I, I think I think that there's other reasons for that log jam that are called 
people and psychological if those aren't fixed i don't think there's any solution to any of this um if, if you basically have two groups who are vehemently opposed to one another i mean what does it matter what kind of system you have it's going to be chaos no matter what there used to be a pretense that those groups represented the citizenry there's no longer any such pretense no but by the way i wanted to mention since um, josh and kayla came in a little later that uh, the the way we kind of got into this i think is interesting because i mentioned this idea imagine if you had a really um, really solid lie detector test that was publicly available and was publicly acknowledged to be reliable that maybe this could shift the incentive landscape towards more truthfulness and then Sam mentioned that he viewed this idea of a dynamic knowledge repository as a kind of distributed lie detection system and truth verification system, which would serve some of the same functions. So I think that's very interesting. Uh, you know, if we could build a system that could really verify true claims and falsify false claims it wouldn't work for everything but it could work for a lot of cases and it could specifically work for cases where a person deliberately knows that they're telling the truth or knows that they're lying or to use a different example that Mary, barry mentioned if i make a claim i kind of make it strongly but do I really believe in the claim? That's a question that could be asked. And if, if I had the lie detector test, then I'd probably say, okay, I'm not so sure, which would be valuable information. I made That's a post about that, which came up in a memory recently, where I just suggested that politicians had to have some lie detector device when they're on the news. And that, that's doable. It, it is doable already. Barry? There's an, actually a funny anecdote. And as far as I know, it's a true anecdote. A journalist was visiting a, a deaf community. They're all living in a big uh, residence for deaf people. And while he was there, Reagan came on the TV that was on off the side of the room giving a speech. And the deaf people all started laughing, pointing at the TV and laughing. And the journalist couldn't understand why they were laughing. And so he asked them and one of the deaf people says, well, <clears throat> this is before closed captioning. So they only could only see his body language and, and the oral communication was missing. And they said, oh, it's because he's lying. We can tell he's lying. The deaf people were absolutely able to determine from Reagan's body language that he was fibbing. Of course, he was known as the great communicator. Reagan. You can probably, if you go Google it, you can probably find the story still somewhere out on the internet about the deaf people being able to recognize when somebody's lying by their facial expressions and body language. Well, and part of being an actor is being able to embody that belief and not to present it. Exactly. He was an actor. He was the, I think, the first you know, A-list actor who ran for office. Now there's quite a few of them. Incredible way of using his voice. Sounded very Perfect good. training. Yeah. Mm. Perfect training. Oh, so, the biggest con in the United States. He sold us trickle down economics. For example. Yeah. The biggest con that's cost us trillions, if not tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars in these decades. And he probably believed the stuff he was saying too. As far as I know, he probably actually believed it. What would have happened if we did have good mathematical models for that? It would have just instantly disappeared, but we didn't. So that con lasted for decades. Yep. It, he didn't do it single-handedly though. 
He was the key instrument. He was the key instrument for it. He didn't write his own speeches. He's an actor. He delivered speeches that other people wrote. That's what actors do. Right. Yeah, there's a whole school of thought that said, hey, let's give money to the rich. This is how we're going to do it. And he was instrumental in selling it. But wasn't he also instrumental in um, solving this issue with the ozone layer? I, I don't know that much about it, but I heard that him and Margaret Thatcher actually negotiated a deal where they managed to get rid of this chemical, which apparently it turned out cost the hole in the ozone layer. Aerosol? Yeah, and Pretty so odd. he... So that was one of the better things he did, apparently. I don't know, don't know that much about it, but it was- Right, what's the point? If I point out that one person did a bad thing, is it necessary to point out the small good things that this person did? No, no, wasn't any point. I just, just uh, remembered it. Uh. Hmm. But, but this okay, larger- Sorry. Yeah. But this larger point of sort of a system to, you know, encourage truthfulness and discourage uh, lying, I think it's a very interesting concept. It should be quite possible to build today. I think many people are, you know, already working on it. And uh, I guess it is, you know, that would be science, the sort of science that the science enthusiasts talk about, like real science would be something like that. But, you know, maybe I'm a bit cynical, but I, I don't see real science existing really today. Yeah. If you don't see real science existing, it's because you've not adopted it in your own head. Don't look to institutions. Don't look to people. Don't look to politicians. See if you understand what the scientific process is and whether you can apply it yourself. There's 8 billion people that can all do that. That's oh, why yeah. science exists. Okay, that I agree with. <laughs> that I agree with. Let me then, maybe I'll rephrase it. I, I don't see it existing institutionally. But I, I can see it existing in, in our minds. And in I, just, I just want to add that there have been many times where I've gone because I wanted to try and look up the science and the problem is it's all behind paywalls. Exactly. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But what good if it exists and, and available? It might as well not exist. That trans not at all. Not that, at all. that transparent system to me, I doesn't mean. exist. Well, Sam, to there be clear, be. what I mean is yeah. for the person looking for the truth, right? if they can't gain access to sure. it. Sure. It's not easy. It's not free. But you perhaps might know a professor who might have access to that particular source. You might know somebody who has access to PubMed. You might know how somebody who has access to Kaggle. You might know somebody who has access to CDC. There's and all possibilities. And, and the fact that they exist means it's possible. It's right. possible. Is it, is it a public good as well, or is it private in some way, which from what I'm hearing, it's private in some way. It is at the moment. That's well, because people invest the economy the works, economy. these things do have to persevere and uh, pay for themselves. Josh has so, the same. Okay, go ahead, Josh. I was just going to follow up with another angle. Go, go ahead, Colin. I'll go after you. I just wanted to support Glenn a little bit, even though I'm, I'm, I'm feeling what, what Sam is saying. I'd like to support Glenn in the idea that we were trying to follow up on the Schmottenberger thread, right? He spoke to a lot of these things that we kind of do agree on. So I think our memory's failing us and our generalities are sinking us. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Yeah, I just want to point that where you guys are going with this conversation is right down the right lane, in my opinion, is if you don't have access to the truth, does the truth exist? And separating the knowledge into affordability and actual value of an economy of knowledge is the conversation I'd like to have maybe another week of knowing who has access to what information and who is right or wrong if you don't have access to the truth and you, the, you do have access to 
is disemboweled by the other information that you don't have access to, then you're just arguing with each other <laughs> because some person knows something that you don't know because they have done that study and they've proven it and validated it, but you don't have the access to that proof or validation. You will not know if it's true or not. And I'd love to have that conversation at some point. I'm complete. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. I would suggest then that for those who actually feel strongly about this, as I do, I agree with this point, that support the institutions who do provide free access to knowledge. And by that, for example, I mean like the Wikimedia Foundation. I, I uh, donate to Wikipedia fairly regularly. And uh, I would say that that's one of the best, maybe not perfect, but it's one of the best sources out there. I would encourage all of us to uh, donate to them. Over. Yeah, so I'm going to, this is not scientific because this is just my observation, but what I'm finding when I'm doing certain searches online is that I'm not even given access to information that I used to be given that I trusted. And I'm talking like, let's say something, some, things on more of um, an esoteric nature, like um, whereas before I could look up Louise Hay's work now I'm getting all these other people that I don't necessarily trust the way I trusted her. And just the fact that it's not coming up in my search and that I can't get what I want. I feel very controlled by the information that, that I'm, that's getting filtered to me. And you know, that, that is a very scary thing. I'm not a big yeah. fan of SEO, search engine optimization. It's optimizing for just one demographic, but not for the consumer. And I'm very good at putting things in different ways. You know, I mean, I did legal research. And so I knew you had to phrase things certain ways to have the best chance of getting the information you wanted. And I can't get it. I cannot get what I want. And I know it's there because I've read it in print 30 years ago, but I can't get it. Yeah, th these are some of the some of the topics that Schmuckenberger, you know, touches on when he speaks about the information ecology in general. And uh, you know, if if we can access true information, then you know, obviously that's a big limitation to to, to this uh, capability. But, but then you have stuff like Wikipedia and uh, Wikimedia. And so you, you have several things which provide valuable, high quality information. And that helps. So that, that you know, shows a little bit of what's possible. But I, I think we need a lot more. And um, yeah, I would love to see also more of sort of the science of the good life, like um, at, at a larger scale. It's, it's so many, and that, that's why I mentioned uh, Andrew Huberman, because uh, and I would also mention someone like Tim Ferriss as an example, you know, people who, who share very valuable resources and knowledge that relate to lifestyle and health and the mental health and you know just living a good life and they're sharing valuable resources and they're very often you know showing um the sources behind it and um you, you can say that that whole ecology of people who shared that knowledge is you know like a, a seed to this you know science of the good life which could become more publicly accessible. I think science of the good life in conditions of, because I think most people want better. So look at their traditions of a community, you'll find hopefully what they've come up with so far. Then you can share things depending, you know, on similarities. Medicines was one, right? People didn't have certain medicines, they could share those. Kind of, you know, uh, knowledge, I guess, is that realm. But 
what you consider better or threatening seems to be a big problem. Um, so in this idealistic thinking, it always breaks down for me in the complexity of um, trying to define what's better. Not doing it in a ty tyrannical way. That once the rules come in, the chaos begins. <laughs> so how do we yeah. naturally, and I would say what's natural for me is investing in children, and investing in the healthy raising of children. Because if you can do that, then there's a lot of other things that are already in the right place. Yeah, that, that's a good good insight because that's something you can actually influence yourself but you can sure. see the con you can see the conflicts there when you know just simplicity of just what should be in the textbooks <laughs> forget about nutrition and a way to get to an educational institution so many different levels of realities out there so what you would want to Say is on the needs list for one child in one community may be very different than the needs list of another community. That's that's the complexity that I find gets overlooked. But I think in the sincerity of good behavior, what I think is a tenant of what you you speak and which I like, you know, that good behavior I think is best behavior when you're putting it into the community and there's nobody more important than your own. And how do you not tell other parents how they should raise their children too? Because <laughs> you see what uh, I'm saying, right? Yeah, because so it's a the, different situation, right? Mm, in... So that is that is the that is the playground. It just gets scaled up from there. Yeah, Hospitals, imagine roads and imagine a system where we empower people with very good tools so they can figure out what's better for them and use that to, to build a good life for themselves and those around them. Yeah. And if they're wearing a Barry Fitbit, then they could see when their derivatives were happening and emotions and they could say, you know what, you know, you're allowed to be angry a little bit, but you've been angry 80% of this week. <laughs> Maybe we should talk mm. about anger management. Yeah, something that can actually feed back and be a good um, independent observer, I guess, a fair witness. But your emotions are actually doing because I think we fool ourselves. Yeah, that, that would be like a high quality community, maybe, if you could get good feedback mechanisms in place. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, guys, I, I have to log off now. But yeah, it's really interesting today. And uh, I hope this, this dynamic knowledge repository will get created. It might take some time. But uh, hey, Glenn, but, uh, please. Yeah. Thank you for tolerating my vehemence today. It's not personal. I really wanted to just pursue this whole theme of truth and reasoning which I believe I've been sitting back, really, really trying to be open-minded, quote unquote, for the last three and a half, four years, and have been frustrated by how it's not leading us towards truth, why it's not leading us towards mutual sense-making and shared root memory. And that's why I've been a little bit more, let's say, emphatic about my position on truth and science. So. Thank you for participating in that with me. Okay, I really do uh, appreciate it. Well, yeah, yeah, thanks for that. I, I, I totally understand. I can relate to that. I mean, it's, it's I, I get very passionate about it too. So it's a, it's a very big topic and it's, it's worth going into. And, and I also want to say that I think if we're, we, we could possibly, you know, go into it in meetings like this, but then we, I mean, we would have to question quite deeply and uh, you know sometimes you know question hard if you like or ask hard questions i think there's probably no way around it right really 
And just one um, comment. I think that conversation you and I had among all the others today, but that conversation you and I had today would not have been possible four years ago. Probably not. Yeah. I just wish it was less distorted. I, I I tried to interrupt a couple times, but when when you start speaking louder, I think it gets clipped. It doesn't it doesn't actually get too loud. It just gets really clipped. So most of it's just you being fuzzy, man. <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's one has to. We should be mindful. We should be mindful. Yeah, we should be mindful of others' sound checks. I think. I would be happy to follow up on, on that thread at some later point. I, I've been a little here and there, so I haven't been able to attend so often. Either, but, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to come now and then. But, but if, if we could have a you know, special convo about that topic, it would be very interesting. So how would you describe that topic? Well, it's certainly related to truth and... Uh, and the knowledge and how we could um, what would be a what what would be a system to to help us to be more truthful personally and collectively and maybe you know if there's different types of ideas you know there's some it's possible to answer others are more vague, but it's a big topic, but it's, you know, it's obviously related to truth. And for example, this question, what do we know to be true? That's an interesting question. Do we know some things to really be true? I think that would be a very interesting topic to just see if we, if we actually know uh. some things. I've been playing in that area. Philosophy is thick, my man. Uh, very thick. <laughs> it is. It is a complicated. <laughs> justified one, true but... belief, you know. Proper justified true belief, and then you got gettier cases, which have been. But let's say, let's say you could collect some facts that we we really have some strong the confidence. Sim. What we need is the sim. What we need is the sim. That's what we. Need. The global the sim, sim. The sim is the mod. Is the sim is this all working in a way that's not falling over too badly? Yeah, that could the sim, be another the sim, way. The sim to is the sim this. is having control of the sliders, right, and being able to tweak yeah. a slider this way and see what happens. If I treat this person not more with more respect, will I get any better results? Okay, they're just abusing me now. I have to treat them with more uh, frankness, right? Now, I, now they've gone and done something I can no longer respect them. So my conversations are now over with this person. Dial my phone number, I'm not there anymore. Like, is that the world we're going to live in? This idea so. of the global sin, that could also be another way to frame this issue, I think. It could be interesting. Because that, that would be kind of a, a, a vision of what would be a system. Let, let's say a transparent knowledge system. That could be an interesting way to frame the topic. Uh, so, but it's a big topic anyway. <laughs> I think I another big one's one Sam no mentioned about freedom of information for you. Is that right? What, what freedom of information? Yeah, because that crosses with what your conspiracy against scientists. There is a known amount of information or an unknown amount of information. A known, unknown amount of information. I feel like a who's that guy, the, the known unknowns <laughs> um, from the, uh, what was that, the uh, Iraq war when they were going in for the weapons of mass destruction, knowns and unknowns. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting topic. Well, anyway, uh, let you all enjoy the first day of the new year. New year, well, I'd new like possibilities. To, I'd like to see anything, Glenn, like Check that. out. Kayla hasn't even said anything yet today. Hi, Kayla. I don't know if she wants to. Um, maybe, maybe that Schmattenberger thing is something we cannot forget about because I think yeah, that was a, let's follow, follow up on that sometime. Yeah, like let's let's put some stakes in the ground with some some things that we have that we could heathers cut loose when it no longer works. Okay. Lens of Schmattenberger guy. Kayla?
want to say something? No, I was just saying bye to Glenn. Uh, I came like at nine, what, 9.30? And um, there was, <laughs> I was like, what did I walk into here? But it's nice to hear um, you guys talking very passionately. It was a food fight. Happy New Year. <laughs> it's good. We're, remember we were talking about anger last week? And sometimes that can be a motivating factor in what you're passionate about. So I don't know if any anger was displayed. I was just like cooking and listening to you guys. So it was fun. <laughs> I see push-ups. Do you want to say something, Boops? <gasps> Hi. It's the GCC. <laughs> there you go thank you guys everyone i just want to say thank you all right bye. cheers bye anything else going once going twice i should save the chat three times before you quit, save the chat. Oh, to the new baby. Are you saved, Barry? Yes, I saved the chat. All right. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>